Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. I'm so glad to see you all. It's a beautiful summer and hot Sabbath day. And uh, I'm glad to see you all. I was somewhat concerned because I knew many of our church members are on vacation. But I'm glad to see so many guests with us this morning. And I would like to also greet those that are away. May God's blessing be with you wherever you are. And we are looking forward to see you back here. We had uh, some wonderful ministry events. The week before this last week and uh, last Sunday... I know we had a VBS and then uh, Forever Young had a great event. Well, uh, I'm so glad to see that uh, God's people get together in ministry, in service. You know, those events, those uh, church family events can bring out the best of us. And sometimes here and there, the worse. Because when we are in interaction, we all know that uh, there are challenges we have to face realistically. This story is uh, a real story about something that happened at a health fair. You know what a health fair is, right? At a health fair, you have um, a uh, test record sheet that you pass out to those that want to benefit. And then, after completing those screenings, they come with the completed sheet, and one of the health professionals can read or interpret those uh, information, that, that information, the data that is in the worksheet. And um, it was happening that in a certain church throughout the week, every evening, they had this wonderful health fair event. And the agreement was that on the final Sabbath, well, not a, on the final day of the event, the volunteers themselves can uh, do their screening, their tasks, and have their data interpreted. And on that day, one of the volunteers that happened to be the wife of uh, one of the well-known and respected church leaders took uh, her test record sheet to one of the health experts, and uh, the health expert looked at uh, that uh, sheet and said, well, this looks horrible. And uh, gave it back to her and said, you know, you just go and get some uh, nice clothes and then go home and uh, get ready. And she was like, get ready for what? Well, for funerals. For funerals, she immediately burst into tears. Of course, she was offended and she walked away. Somebody overheard the discussion and uh, went to that person and asked, why would you speak like that to her? And this is the argument that person used. Well, she needs to know the truth. I told her the truth. I know it's pretty shocking. And you may think, well, that cannot even happen in the American culture. Different cultures have different ways of approaching the truth and communicating the truth. For instance, if you want to do a research, you can Google this question. Should the doctor tell the truth to the patient? And I'm telling you, you will find all kinds of answers, from yes to no. 
Because different people in different times and different cultures will have a different attitude toward the truth and how to communicate that truth. Now, fact is, after more than 20 years, that person is still alive. So, uh, it wasn't the best uh, truth to communicate. But then the question can be, okay, so how is it that she is still alive? Maybe that answer shocked her that much that she went home and changed her lifestyle, and there she is now still alive. Truth is not easy to handle. It is pretty complicated to communicate truth to somebody, especially when that truth is not something a person would necessarily want to hear. Let's pray and see how God teaches us. Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings and for your truth, your word that communicates to us and gives us a sense of how we should approach truth and how we should communicate that in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would like to start reading from Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, right from the beginning, and I would need your attention and please see where it's going. Because this whole passage is going somewhere where we will be dealing with the truth and how to communicate the truth. Tell me the truth, but not like that right? So, Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And he's addressing people in Christ's body, the church. With all lowliness and gentleness with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Could you quickly count how many times the Apostle Paul uses the word one? Seven times. That's remarkable. And uh, indeed, he speaks about unity. He says in uh, verse 3, endeavoring making an effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of shalom. And then he uses the word one, which refers back to unity, seven times. He underlines, he emphasizing the concept of unity. And then, as he moves on, he starts with one word. Look what that word is. But. What is that? Well, that's called an adversative conjunction, which means that whatever I spoke up to this point, yes, it is true. However, but there is something else about it as well. There is something that may change, may alter the picture somewhat, but to each one of us. So, as much as I emphasize unity, he says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ Jesus. And I would need you to somehow create a mental picture of the measure of Christ Jesus. And for the sake of illustration, 
I'm going to use this picture as a measure for Christ. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then Paul goes on giving us some historic reality behind this giving of gift according to the measure of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, therefore, he says, and he quotes from the book of Psalms, when he ascended on high, he led captivity or a multitude of captives. That's another way of translating that Greek word. He led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Verse 9, now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of earth. Verse 10, he who ascended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things, says uh, the NKJ, but a better translation is just fill all because this is about each one of us. So he fills all all of us, each one of us. So the picture is this. Jesus Christ fills each one of us. Verse 11, and he himself gave some. I said this is about some historic reality. You know, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27, we are told that uh, around the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, some amazing things happened. And among other things, some that were dead were resurrected. Some. And those people according to the previous verse, they, well, verse 8, they were taken from captivity captive. The picture is this. Jesus Christ goes to the captivity of death, and from there He takes captives a multitude of captives, captive, and then he gives gifts to men. In a compressed manner, this is a description of what happened on the day of Pentecost. Because on the day of Pentecost, those that were resurrected at Jesus' resurrection are taken as a trophy by Jesus Christ in front of the Heavenly Father, in front of the throne, and they are presented as a token of His victory over death. And it's at that time when the Holy Spirit is poured out, according to Acts chapter 2, and the Holy Spirit from Jesus, from Jesus' measure, gives gifts to man. And after clarifying this aspect, it goes on in verse 11, saying that He Himself, that is Christ Himself, gave some to be apostles. And apostles in those days were some people that were sent with a cargo ship, admirals, that were in charge of a cargo ship with a specific shipment that had to go somewhere to complete a specific mission that was called Apostolos, and even the cargo ship itself sometime was called Apostolos. So, Jesus Christ gave some to be apostles, meaning people that go, that are sent, because that's the meaning of Apostolos, apostello, 
sent from in the Greek, and we also have in English epistle, apostle and epistle as the same root because apostle is sent from and epistle, which is a letter, sent to. So, the apostles are sent forth or sent off from somebody with a specific mission to complete in a certain place. And we can see that the apostles were doing that kind of mission in Jesus' time when He sent them, His twelve. They were apostles, emissaries, ambassadors, sent offs of Jesus Christ. But then it says that He also gave some to be, apostles, uh, to be prophets. And prophet is etymologically to speak before somebody, to speak for somebody, to speak on behalf of somebody. And yes, please notice this is plural, Jesus Christ Himself also gave prophets. This is important to see that this is plural because that does not limit the gift of prophecy to one single person. Then it goes on saying that some are given to be evangelists. Evangelists are those that carry the good news from one place to the other. And if you know a little bit about the history of Christianity and even the history of Seventh-day Adventism, we used to have much more evangelists. Unfortunately, for some reasons that are beyond us probably, we have few evangelists today. And somehow, we have come to a place where it is expected that pastors would be evangelists and apostles and prophets and everything in one. But it seems that the biblical picture is somewhat more diverse. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Notice it doesn't say some pastors and some teachers, because biblically, pastors and teachers are the same group. In the church, those that are called pastors and even the elders, they practically function in these two responsibilities to pastor and to teach. And now we are given what exactly these that are called pastors and teachers are supposed to be doing. Verse 12. Well, Paul was uh, a lot of things. But Paul is saying that this is what Jesus Christ says. And indeed, Paul was an apostle. He can be seen as a prophet in some moments. He can also be seen as evangelist and also as pastor and teacher. Nevertheless, when you look at the overall picture, again, the text is going somewhere. The text will not spend too much time on defining what is what, what the role of the apostles, what the role of um, the prophets, what the role of the evangelists is. What the text says, it moves on identifying what the role of this last category, pastors and teachers, meaning those that are dealing specifically with the local church, because the responsibility of the others is wider. And this is what they are supposed to do. They are given for or toward the equipping or training or making fit or mending, like mending nets or repairing of the saints. So that's the resp responsibility of pastors and teachers. And uh, I used to emphasize with my pastor colleagues and the elders that our responsibility here is not to overwork, not to kill ourselves, 
working, working, working. Our responsibility is equipping. Equipping the saints for two things. And I'm pointing out there that these two things are things that we, the pastors and the teachers, are supposed to equip the saints for, because both are introduced with ice or ace into, into the work of ministry and into the edifying of the body of Christ. Meaning, ideally, as a church body, as Christ's body, we, the pastors and the teachers of the church, are supposed to train, to equip, to teach, to make fit, so that the saints, each one according to the measure, and we'll see how that measure works, each one of us, according to the measure that was given to us, will be able to do two things. What? To do ministry, and the work is diaconia, which is deaconry. To do ministry, and to do what? To edify, to build up the body of Christ. Now, I just want to rhetorically ask to search yourself, asking yourself this question. Do I do those two things? Do I serve? And I know many of you do. And do I edify? Do I build up the body of Christ? Moving on, verse 13 says, till we all come so there is, there is a target, there is a focal point there. Till we all come or we all arrive at the unity of the faith or faithfulness and of the knowledge of the Son of God to perfect or complete or mature, fully grown men to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And if this is the measure of the fullness of Christ, it seems that all these recipients here have way to go, right? To grow until we reach the same measure. And we've seen before that the fullness of Christ, which is the fullness of God actually living in Him, is practically, practically the fullness of grace and truth because He came to us and we saw His glory and He was full of what? Grace and truth. Unity is emphasized again. We first heard about the unity of the Spirit and now we hear about the unity of faith or faithfulness, and also the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. So, Paul says that all these unities are possible. It is possible to get to unity, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, the unity of the faithfulness of the Son of God, and the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. Of God. I have to note something here. This is unity of the body of Christ. And the unity of the body of Christ is not necessarily the same as the unity of all people in the building of the church. Which means that you and I can be unified in Jesus Christ if we indeed take the command from the head and are part of the body of Jesus Christ. We could well be sitting in the church building and yet not be part of the unity of the body of Jesus Christ. And that is a sobering thought for me. 
But the text goes on, verse 14, that we should no longer be children. What? Jesus said we should be children. Yes, Jesus said we should be children in some ways. And the Apostle Paul says we shouldn't be children in some other ways. In what way? We should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is teaching. And we should not be like a, a vessel or like a ship or a boat tossed to and fro by all the waves, all the winds of doctrine, by the trickery of man. I was looking for something that could illustrate what Paul had in mind, because the Greek word there is kubeia or kubos. That's where we get cube from or dice. You know what the dice is? Yeah, I was looking for a dice that I knew my children had. It seems that the dice disappeared. But you have the picture of a dice. Well, throughout history, there were all kinds of tricksters that knew how to use the dice in a way that they will win and others will lose, to trick them, to fool them. And that's what Paul says. We should not be tricked by people in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now, somebody defined that for me. That is something very convoluted, very complicated, very complex. Cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Verse 15, but, again, and this is where he was heading, because I, I kept telling you, hey, 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 watch, watch the text and see where it's going. This is where it was going. But speaking the truth, tell me the truth, but not like that, right? Speaking the truth how? In love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. Speaking the truth, is there truth? Is such thing as truth? Is that something real? Does truth exist? You will find people in today's society that will tell you that the only truth is that there is no truth. But the majority of people that have reasonable thinking will still admit truth exists. But, and this is one of the major misleading ideas, truth is relative. Yes, truth does exist, but truth is relative. And I would ask, is it? So, if truth is relative, I'm going to ask you, what is this? Uh-uh, it's not. No. It is what I want it to be. In my mind, this is a cat. Yes, and in my mind, this can meow. You don't like that? Okay, it's going to be a dog in my mind. It can woof. Or, if you don't like that, it's a turtle. Do you understand what the problem of relative truth is? It messes reality up and makes language useless. Because this has to be a piano. I can't even call this a harpsichord, although harpsichord looks somewhat similar. And I can't call this an organ because that's the organ. See what the, the, the challenge of relative truth is? Well, some will say, okay, truth may not be relative, but truth is progressive. Progressive. Well, is truth progressive or is the revelation of truth progressive or the understanding of truth progressive? A few years ago, 
knowing that I was interested in knowing who I was, my wife bought me a kit of DNA tests. If you want some money to waste, <laughs> be my guest. But here, here it is. I do my test. I'm really curious to see what mix is in my DNA. And I uh, send in the tests. In a few weeks, they send me the results. And I look at the chart. And I come to settle and say, OK, it seems that this is who I am. Well. A few weeks later, another set of results come <laughs> with the message, your DNA did not change. Science about it changed. So then my question is, did the truth change? Is truth progressive? Or rather, the revelation or the comprehension, the understanding of the truth is progressive. And then some would say, well, truth may be not relative. Truth may not even be progressive. But truth should not be told. Keep it for yourself. Yeah, there is a challenge with that too. A few years ago, my father was diagnosed with cancer, lung cancer. And one of my close family relatives told me, you know, they shouldn't have told him he had cancer. And in theory, you could say, yes, you're right. But can you say that really? Because then the question is, what should they have told him? Should they have told him uh, he had no cancer? Should they have told him he had a cough? How did we end up in a situation where you have facts and alternative facts? See what the challenge is? Okay, but this is something that can apply to all kind of truths. Scientific truth, historical truth. My interest is to see how the truth of God about salvation functions, which I believe this is. So I will have some that will say, you know, the truth about the truth of salvation is that there is no truth of salvation. So get used to it, sit back and relax. When you are gone, you're gone. But then, some would say, and I, I think those that say there is truth of salvation, but they redefine truth can be more challenging than those that deny it. Those that deny it, okay, their option. But I will be told, well, you know, truth of or about salvation does exist, but it is relative. So then again, I'm thinking, what is relative? Is the truth relative or the understanding of the truth is relative? Because I could imagine somebody that in point A has a certain understanding of the truth, generally speaking. And then that person moves to point B, and in point B that same person has a uh, somewhat different kind, or maybe radically different kind of understanding of the truth in point B. Is this relative to that? Of course. But it's not the truth relative. It's the understanding of the truth relative. There is a, a pretty famous pastor. I'm not going to say his name because uh, you may uh, think I'm on this side or on that side. Well, Fact is, I appreciate very much this pastor, not necessarily that I agree with everything he says, but I appreciate him in a special way because some time ago, in one of his public presentations, he came out and said, you know, 
Years ago, I used to teach this, and he was speaking about the 24 elders in the book of Revelation. And we have some very specific truth established historically about that. But he said, you know, I preached this for many years, and I have come to the conclusion I was wrong, and this is how I see it now. And that won my respect, because I saw somebody there that didn't say the truth changed in the meanwhile. What he said, in the meanwhile, my understanding about the truth changed, which is totally respectable. And I believe that's the right way of approaching the truth, being honest and not pushing something that we got, because there may be something that we missed. Yeah, but truth is progressive. The truth of salvation, you, you look in the Bible and you will see that there is one certain kind of truth in the Old Testament and one certain kind of truth in the New Testament. Is a different truth presented in different ways, in different places, or rather the revelation of the truth is progressive and its comprehension is progressive. And for that, I'm going to quote from Ellen G. White. Ellen G. White in uh, Review and Herald said this in 1892. This is after 1888, for those that are familiar with Seventh-day Adventist denominational history. There is no excuse for anyone in taking the position that there is no more truth to be revealed. So that means that the revelation of... have been held as truth for many years by our people. It's not a proof that our ideas are infallible. Age will not make error into truth. Nothing will be lost. Why is it so important for us to understand these things? Because contrary to what we are told, because we are told we should not speak the truth, the Apostle Paul says, speaking the truth. That is, we are supposed to speak the truth. But how? Actually, the way the Apostle Paul puts it, he uses the word truth as a verb. Can you, can you picture that? I checked and I discovered that in Old English, they used to have two truth. The word truth as a verb. We don't use it anymore. But it's the same concept that you can see in the use of, for instance, hope. You have the noun hope, correct? And you have the verb to hope. Does that make sense? I hope, you hope, she hopes, he may hope, and on it goes. So similarly, you can say in the way the Apostle Paul has it, that we are truthing in love. We speak the truth in love. Ah, that's a, a little limitation. No, no. He says we truth in love. I truth, you truth, she truths, we truth. It's a verb. 
which means that actually this true thing in love is more than just speaking the love. Are you, are you still following the process? It's more than just speaking the truth. It is doing the truth. It is living the truth. It is speaking the truth. And it is be truthful, but all of these how? In love. Because in love, you have two components. You have grace and truth. And that means that always when you speak the truth, you have to speak grace and truth because you speak truth in love. One day, uh, a truth teller, you know, there are professional truth tellers. A truth teller told me, Pastor, I'm going to tell you how you convey an ugly truth. You take two slim slices of grace, and in between, you place a big, fat, ugly truth, Patty. You create that and you pass it out there. Mm -mm. No. Better to create a salad of grace and truth. And maybe put a little more grace than truth in it. Because that's the way Christ showed us. He communicated grace and truth to us like that. For him, truth was extremely important to the level where he said, I am the truth. So we cannot blame him, telling him that, no, you are not about the truth. No, he was. But he knew something, that growth, and please notice, truth should always be lived, done, spoken with growth in view. Because for somebody to be able to grow, you need grace and truth. If you will give your child, especially if that's a teenager, only grace, you will get complacence, and that child is in their danger of self-destruction. If you only give that child truth, you will get rebellion, and that's another path to self-destruction. We grow sinful but saved by grace, human beings, by grace and truth. Grace lifts us up and truth gets us going. And it's a mix of grace and truth all the way through. I'm sharing this with you guys because I've experienced in my own life the struggle between grace and truth, or another way to put it, between the gospel and the law. That's the historic way of speaking about it. You know, I grew up in a small country church out in the middle of nowhere. We were very few in that church. But we were proud about it because we had the truth, if you understand what I'm saying. We were all about the truth, to the point where my father would not come to church, rarely, now and there, but he would fight like crazy for the truth. And I'm not blaming him, that's what he knew. He was all about the truth. Then when I was around 10, together with my elder brother, we started to go to a somewhat larger church where they had a larger group of youth and music and whatnot. So we get involved there, and uh, I noticed the same thing. Truth is really important, very important. You know those churches that have a balcony? Okay, not here, but there. Okay, so you have two layers. You have the people sitting down, and then you have a, a huge uh, upstairs. I would sit upstairs in the first row, and 
look to see what's happening down there, and I would see a huge bag full of thick books. And uh, next to that bag, there was an elderly lady, and her nickname was, of all things, Sister White. Because during Sabbath school, and sometimes at the end of the service, she would reach for one of those thick books, stand up, like electrified, start reading, reading up from that book, but in a hammering manner. You know, the, the, the impression I had is that that person is hitting people in their head with uh, the book. And I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what. And don't take these stories too far because people and people in the same church learn from one another. There were people in that church that, was, that were the counterpart of it. There was an elderly guy that in the afternoon would gather us gracefully graciously, the teenagers, because he had the impression everybody abandoned us, and he would teach us all kind of beautiful things from the Bible. So there were people that got it right as well. But I, 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 was, I was like, something, something is missing, what is it? So because God was drawing me, at one point I made the decision I was going to go and study theology with two main ideas in mind. One, I want to be able to read the truth in its original language, languages, and I want to be able to read Ellen G. White in her original language because I couldn't believe that was the hitting in the head that Ellen White was about. So I studied theology. In my second year of theology, I became an atheist. And you may say, how is that even possible? It's possible. You know how? There is some emotional turmoil going on in your heart, and then you perceive some injustice happening here and there with you and around you, and you come to the conclusion something is wrong with the truth. You understand the process? Something is wrong with the truth. So I started questioning the truth. I started questioning the Bible and the God behind the Bible. And it was bad. There's no scarier place to be than for somebody that had God waking up one day with no God. That's a scary place. But somebody again graciously came to me and told me, Joe, I understand what you're going through, but please picture what you're going through as a raft, a raft of logs. You know what a raft of logs looks like, log after log connected. And he said, listen, if you are going to play this game, dismantling your raft and letting log by log go, you will end up where you will have the final, the last log, and then you will have to let it go, and you sink and you drown. Stay on the raft. Investigate. Truth has nothing to waste, to lose. Investigate, and if you find a better raft, just jump from this raft on that raft and go on. I said, hmm, that's great. And that's what I did. I investigated, and I discovered that there is no other God postulated by philosophy or religion that has this beautiful mix of grace and truth that relates to me. But I was not still convinced on a practical level. I started ministry, I started preaching, and what do you think I started preaching? I was very appreciated because of that. I preached what? The truth. 
Because that's the default mechanism. Preach the truth. Hit them hard. And they will say, yeah, you gave it to them. And then a few years into my ministry, I'm going to an existential cri uh, crisis that scares me. And some people, again, graciously and gracefully come at my side and tell me, Joe, you need to see the grace of Jesus Christ as the center of all truth. Otherwise, this is going to be a torture for you. And thank God, a process started, and I decided to reorganize the structure of truth around the concept of God's saving grace, because Paul says, through by grace you are saved through faithfulness, His faithfulness. What do you think? After I started preaching, living, doing, and speaking, preaching grace and truth, was it easier for me? Huh? Harder. You don't believe me? Try it out. You will see what you will get if you will try to preach grace and truth in that order and maybe for the sake of safety, a little more on the side of grace for the sake of saving the sinner. Brothers and sisters, Grace and truth both are important. Truth is in danger these days, big danger. As a follower of Christ, you are called to live the truth, do the truth, speak the truth, be truthful. But there is a politically correct way of telling the truth. Oh, politically correct? Yes, according to his policy, God's politically correctness. You know what that is? Tell the truth in love. Grace and truth. Tell the truth. Tell me the truth, but not like that. Tell me the truth always in love for His glory. Amen.